I want to put the world record out there further. Because right now, it's, it's, it's 29 four and a half is a very far jump, and, and I'm very proud of that. But it's, it's, it is within reach of more than just myself right now. There's about five or six guys I can rattle off right now who, if they hit a great jump, could break the world record. You know, you ride the bulls. Unfortunately for me, I had my chest broke, punctured my lung, you know, broke some ribs, broke my wrist, broke my leg four times, you know, just on and on, broke my face. You know, I broke, I was telling somebody today, I uh, broke everything on my body except my nose. I think we take for granted that we can get up and we can walk across the room or something like that until it comes to a point where you're almost close to losing your feet. And now every day that I wake up and I'm able to put my feet on the ground, I give thanks to God that I still have them. Ownership in this country is kind of like, let's not let track become professional. I mean, if you take the quickest running backs and wide receivers and say you can make the same amount of money just running down the track, as opposed to running down the track and being hit in the head, getting blindsided, getting your knees blown out, what would you do? Welcome to our summertime edition of The Other Side of Victory. I'm James Brown. And I'm Robin Roberts. It's time for the outdoor track and field season in Europe. And we've taken a look into our 1996 crystal ball. Ooh, doing a little forecasting, huh? Well, Robin will also profile some 1996 hopefuls, plus salute the venerable idols of today's stars who helped inspire them along the way. And James, it is also rodeo season. Did you know it was the Black Cowboy who actually won the West? Well, they did. And the King of the Bull Riders is the subject of one poignant story out of the Casa Grande, Arizona. Did you ever see me on a horse? That's an interesting thought. That it was indeed. Oh, by the way, it's almost hockey season, and we'll salute the first black NHL hockey player, Willie O'Ree. And what would a summer show be without a salute to a marvelous woman, Wyomia, and a man named Moses, Edwin Moses? All this and much more on our summer edition of The Other Side of Victory. Mike Powell was just four years old when Bob Beeman set one of the most durable records in all of sports, a long jump of 29 feet and two and a half inches in the rarefied air of the 1968 Mexico City Olympics. When he broke the record, I was four years old, so I didn't really have much um, thoughts about it at the time. Um, later, when I was in high school, I got a chance to measure it out and see how far the jump really was, and I couldn't believe anybody could do that, and I felt like nobody ever would jump that far at the time. But then I was a 23 foot long jumper, so I guess my mind was different. In competition, I, I tend to, to thrive off of people doing things like that, because then I feel like, okay, that was in my face, okay, I'm gonna come back and do something for you now. But, um, wow. I guess if somebody were to jump, come out and jump two feet, almost beyond the world record. So if somebody were to come out and jump 31 feet, I think it might take me out of it a little bit. <laughs> it just might. Powell felt that it was inevitable that someone would break that mark, but that someone he thought would be Carl Lewis. I think that early in his career, I felt like, like he should have broken the record. And um, at that time, I was nowhere. I was not in his class at all. And I got better and better and better over time. And for me, the world record became my goal and my focus. And for him, he was kind of jumping, he was running, he was here and there. And I think for him, he felt like, oh, if a day happens where I can try to go for the record, then I will. So I don't think that was his goal. And that was my goal. That was my total focus. What inspired Powell even more was the response of the huge Tokyo crowd of 62,000. When you're out there competing, you got to feel like you are the best out there in the track. And that was a, a big thing in me breaking the world record that day. Carl had been the man for 10 years. And when you stepped onto the track, you were stepping onto his long jump runway. It's like, can we jump with you today, Carl? Because we know we can't beat you. <laughs> Carl and I were you know, shooting glares at each other across the track, you know, because he was jumping on one side, I was on the other side. And um, I think we set up the tension, because even walking out to the stadium when they were leading the athletes out, he was walking in front, and then just before he stepped on the track, I cut in front of him and walked in front of him. So just, I mean, it was tension out there on the track. I think the people in the stands could pick up on it. When I stepped onto the runway, before I even started to run, I knew I was going to do it then. I wasn't thinking, okay, I'm going to break the world record. I'm thinking, I'm going to go in the first place and jump further than Carl did. As soon as I started running, I felt my rhythm going. I knew it was going to be a great jump. Even though I had to yell after I got in the air. And at that point, I knew it was far. I came back and looked, and I said, okay, that's it. I knew it was a record.
Brother's getting older. Not old. I've always been a competitor. When I was younger, I hardly had to stretch. Now I hardly can stretch. A lot of things got to do now. It's not so simple anymore. Does having the Olympics in our own backyard for the second time in a dozen years mean another world record is around the corner? There's about five or six guys I can rattle off right now who, if they hit a great jump, could break the world record. I, I, I consider myself to be, I guess, a patriotic person, but, but I'm not going to walk around carrying the flag and yes, yes, yes. But when you hear somebody chanting, USA, you, oh man, it gives you chills. It's really weird. When you put that uniform on, you see USA. It's like, wow, I'm jumping for like everybody in the United States. It, it is uh, a motivating factor. And so looking forward to Atlanta, I'm sure that they'll be very much into the competition. Oh, in Barcelona, uh, my mental state was uh, just fabulous. I was on a uh, cloud nine. I was prepared to run. And I think uh, the whole Olympic experience just took me to another level, and I was able to compete and stay focused. And by doing those things, I ran well. Does Quincy see any more Olympic gold in his future during the Atlanta Summer Games? When you step on the track, and it's USA against all the rest of the competitors. Everybody's going to be cheering for you. That type of support, I think that, that's what's going to make world records, and that's what's going to bring uh, spectacular performances from the U.S. team. I guess chasing the world record for a number of years, and then the year that I really concentrated on myself, as opposed to trying to concentrate on the record, I ran and broke the record. The fact that I know the games are going to be in Atlanta in 96, I'm ready to go. I think I would retire in 92 if, uh, if uh, Atlanta wouldn't have got the games. That's the only reason they're even motivated more. It's just like I feel that since I started my Olympic career in the uh, United States, I would love to end my Olympic career in the United States. So I'm undefeated at home, so I look at it that way. That's one of the reasons why I think Jackie, my wife, has decided to go another Olympic Games because she knows she can finish her Olympic career in American soil. You know, she can finish it in Atlanta. You know, she start in California and get to finish it in, in Atlanta. And uh, that, you know, that's exciting to me to be able to have another Olympic Games at, at home. Ninety-six means a chance for me to redeem myself, a personal challenge, a personal goal. It means making that Olympic team in America, representing the United States, and proving to myself and my family that you know I'm a world-class hurdler and I could, you know, run with the best and represent, you know, USA. Barcelona was a dream come true for me. It was, it was great, just the feeling of being there, something that I wanted to do. And in 1988, I was there, but I, that was the start of my Graves' disease, so I didn't compete well. And to be back in 1992, it was, you know, unimaginable to me, because it was like I didn't think that I'd ever be back on the track in the first place. And to be there in the Olympic Games actually competing and not being a spectator was, for me, was the greatest feeling in the world. For me, I'll be watching from the stands. <laughs> for those guys, I'll be rooting for because they're from the United States. And with it being here in the United States, I'm looking forward to it. I finally get a chance to sit and watch and not be a part of the, uh, the uh, I guess, the, the goings on on the track itself and get to sit back and just enjoy and say, yeah, go Kevin or go Quincy or go Gail or go Jackie and uh, be happy with that. Gail was one of the truly amazing stories of last year's Olympic Games in Spain so special she'll return later to talk about her battle with Graves' disease. Next up, track and field. Do a parent's fees in Europe make it a viable sport financially? If you look in the Olympics, but pro basketball, there's professional players in basketball, there's pro soccer players, pro tennis players, pro, pro basketball players have been playing for years anyway, hockey, and, and we're still trying to hold on to this amateur um, title. And, and it's just, it's not really real. It's, it's a big farce. When you hear the millions being doled out in baseball, the NBA, and now the NFL thanks to free agency, the question you might have is, can appearance fees abroad and endorsements make track and field a viable alternative to the big three sports? No matter how many gold medals you win, if you're a track athlete, getting endorsements is tough. 
at least in the United States. But in Japan and Europe, you might see a track star just like you would a local soccer hero. Only time people really get into track and field is during the Olympics or World Championships. And it's just now becoming really televised to where people are really becoming aware of the people that's among track and fields or the players that makes it track and field special. When people think of track and field, it's after they've thought about football, basketball, and baseball. <laughs> then, oh, well, yeah, track and field, that sport. Track is very important. They don't have football teams. They don't have baseball teams. They don't have hockey teams. They don't have all the things that we take for granted here in the United States. So it's easier to promote. I mean, it's easier for athletes to come over there and be a star. The crowd is amazing. It's like compared to basketball or football out here. They chant, they tackle you for, for autographs. They call your name. You know, I was in Zurich. I was in a B heat and I won my race. So, Mark, we love you. And I threw my flowers on the stage. And it was just a great feeling. You do get almost like a rock star image when you're a, you're a track athlete and you're going to the Europe, uh, the big meets in Helsinki and, and the England, London, Crystal Palace. Willie Banks used to compare it to, like the old blues singers would, would be famous and jazz players uh, would be famous in Europe. And, and they would come home to America and nobody knew them. But to go there, go to Lyon and in places in France and whatever, and they were huge. It's a viable professional sport now. It has been struggling for the last 15, 20 years in this country. It has continued to grow in Europe. But I say it's viable now because in the last couple of months, the International Track Federation has struck a contract for a $90 million television deal. And as a result of that, the exposure for professional track is going to be significantly greater than what we've ever seen. The big four European meets, which are Oslo, Zurich, Berlin, and uh, Brussels, uh, they have a TV contract alone that's paying, I think, $5 million a year. Can you believe that? Just for, just for those four meets. So the numbers are, and so each of those meets is going to have prize money of well over a million dollars. I consider myself as one of the people who made the transition from a sport in which top athletes were getting paid a hundred a uh, thousand or fifteen hundred dollars to to now where a top athlete can get as much as thirty to fifty thousand dollars and even more in special cases nobody's going to make seven or eight million dollars a year but you have some athletes who will who'll make close to a million and a lot who will make in the hundred thousand range and certainly most of them in the fifty sixty thousand dollar range so good living yeah yeah, with our trust funds, you know, keeping the amateur status, with me I also have road racing, so we, I mean, I'm at home also and I run a road race here and there and you get a little bit of pocket money, help pay the bills. So you can, uh, if you, depending on how well you do, you can make a living, but it sometimes depends, like anything else, on how well you're running. Now we have that same dichotomy that we've had with other sports here. The athletes are saying, okay, if there's going to be a $90 million television package, how much are we going to get? Because unless you just want to show the track with nobody running around it, it's not going to be very entertaining. Uh, so the athletes have asked for $10 million in a Grand Prix kind of formula for doing that. But the reality of it is, like all sports, if they get their $10 million package, and you're talking about 20, 30 major meets a year and you're talking 10 or 15 events in each meet there's only going to be three winners in each event so unless you're getting into appearance fees for people just showing up it's only going to be given to the people who win which means it will still be the elite who are getting those dollars we should have prize money meets have a like a half a million dollar meet or a million dollar meet and treat it like they do a golf tournament or a tennis tournament on a prize money basis and I think you could. You could get a Bo Jackson type in, in multiple sports. Uh, Willie Galt would have done it this year, but he, he, he just wasn't quite good enough in track and field anymore. If you look at football, you can see a lot of the athletes that are in the sport now got their start in track and field. Because football, you know, they, it's based on speed. Speed wins games. And if you look at most of the wide receivers and running backs, they ran track and field. And uh, if a Willie Galt could have stayed in track and field and knew he could have made more money, and you look at Ronaldo Nehemiah, he went out of the sport when money was just coming into the sport. And athletes like himself, they would, be, they would lose a lot of athletes. So I do agree, but at the same time, there's enough athletes to go around, and I think that we need our share.
I think my other buddies who are going on in, in their sports, which is football, baseball, majority of them in football, uh, I wish them well, and, and they're going to have a lot of success, and, and they're going to be wealthy. But uh, track and field is, is not taking a back a back seat to any of them overseas because we, we do well also. People ask me all the time, well, I know you're the world record holder, but what do you do? I mean, you work, right? And I'm like, yeah, I work. I'm a professional track and field long jumper. <laughs> and they don't realize that there's a lot of money. It's big money in the sport. And, and even now at this point, it's, whereas in, in the NBA, they talk about the contracts that are in the newspaper, $2.1 million, $3.5 million. And people are like, <sighs> and they, you know, they respect that. And in track and field, there's a lot of money. But even now, I'm reluctant to say how much money I make, although I do pay taxes on my money. But, you know, people keep that hush-hush instead of saying, okay, I'll make a million, I'll make a million dollars this year. Instead of saying that so that young kids can look and say, oh, well, I can make some money in track and field. So we need to change that perspective so that people realize that it is a viable sport. Ownership in this country is kind of like, let's not let track become professional. I mean, if you take the quickest running backs and wide receivers and say you can make the same amount of money just running down the track as opposed to running down the track and being hit in the head, getting blindsided, getting your knees blown out, what would you do? Yeah. So I think from that standpoint, the individual nature of the sport is a draw rather than a detriment. Uh, the economics has always been the downside. If the economics ever become on a parallel basis, sports will change drastically. Olympic gold. This is what every track and field athlete dreams of and what Wyoming Atias won at the age of 19 when she beat her friend Edith McGuire in Tokyo 29 years ago. The coach, who's also my coach at Tennessee State where I was in school, he was a coach of the Olympic team and he was basically saying to me that it's just great that you've made the Olympic team. That's all we're looking for. We think you're going to do wonders in 68. So. 64 and so doing my whole doing the trials and everything and doing each heat of my hundred meters I felt real comfortable and good about it and he, he was busy saying well you look good that's great we still don't expect you to do too much and then when it came down to the finals he says to me well you look so good I think you may have a chance of winning a medal. The women's hundred meter and watch for Wyoming Atias of the USA and Edith McGuire. Here they are coming on strong Wyoming Atias winning it, Edith McGuire of the USA finishing second, and Ava Globokowska of Poland finishing third. I went out and I'd never beaten Edith really in a uh, top competition before. Uh, so from start to finish, I was out there. Well, and then I could hear her footsteps coming and it was like, it was so difficult. And all I could remember the coach always saying, never look around, never look to the side, because if you look to the right, somebody will pass you on the left. And uh, right at the uh, finish line, Edith was right there. We were both right there. And, but I won. I turned around and I asked her, who won? Because I didn't, th I, you know, you just didn't know. Because it's, for me, it was more that she had always beat me. So it was kind of like, well, you know, she was right there. And we both were right there. So winning that medal was really great for me. But I really didn't have an opportunity to really enjoy it. Because right after winning it, and competing in Olympics had to come back and go back to school and then start thinking about another four years for Mexico City. Four years later, Ms. Tyus became the first person in modern Olympic history to win back-to-back -back gold medals in the 100-meter dash, that at the ripe old age of 23. Here it is four years later, still in great shape. I'm still, you know, still running the same times that the other athletes are running. And, and I'm not an old lady, I'm just 23. <laughs> but when I was competing, 23 was just, uh, you would consider it just an old person to be competing. And nowadays, the athletes are running today 35, 40 or more. And um, so those three, four years in between, the third year was just 
oh, I just never thought I would make it. But once convincing myself I could do it, I had nothing to lose, and everybody else had whatever to lose, and there was no way I thought I would ever lose that 100 meters in Mexico City. I thought that 100 meters had my name on it. That's it. When the gun went off, I got one of the best stars in my life. And from, I started running from start to finish, and I never looked back. And uh, I, it was just, you know, you can't explain how it felt. It's like all the years that you've trained, all of that, just tied into 11 seconds, and that's what it took me to win that. But it was great for me because it was, I knew I was going to retire from the competition, and I knew it's no better way to retire than be on top. The Tennessee State grad then proceeded to found the Women's Sports Association to give back to the sport she loves. I think that uh, now women have a lot more opportunities and they have a lot more people to look up to to have their sheroes or heroes or however you want to say it. <laughs> and that uh, I think it's wonderful. I just think that, you know, that uh, it's a lot out there and uh, you just don't go out there and say, well, I'm a woman, I'm supposed to have it, and this is supposed to be mine, but you have to go out there with the talent to do it, you know, to compete, to be able to get the athletic scholarship, but not just go out there thinking I am a woman and this is what I deserve, more that you have to have the ability to get it. Just drive and determination, you learn that through competing I, and I just can't say it's track and field that you learn. You learn that in any sport. And uh, it teaches you to be tough and to uh, stay in there, to hang in there. And it teaches you to set goals. It teaches you to accomplish those goals. And if you don't, it also teaches you how to go about doing these things because you just don't get out there and start running their steps and doing it. You have to, your body first have to be fit. And that's not only your body, your mind. So I, those, that's something I would like to be able to take to young people and say, you know, it's just not a sport. It's more than a sport. It's a sport of knowing who you are as a person. We're going to return after a short time out to trace the courageous comeback of 1992 Olympic hero Gail Devers and find out what the new Flojo is doing now here on the other side of victory. Welcome back to The Other Side of Victory. Coming up a little later, a visit with the king of the bull riders, Charlie Sampson. And Graves' disease could not stop Gail Devers from attaining her Olympic dream. Plus, we'll visit with prep star Marion Jones, who experts are billing as a next Flojo. Mm, well, that's a tall statement. But first, did you know that black cowboys were actually the heroes of the Wild West? That's right, and their memory lives on in the hearts of today's rodeo cowboys. <laughs> percentage of cowboys in the American West were, were black cowboys. One of the reasons I continue to rodeo, as we talked about earlier, I'm 39 years old, I want to carry on the heritage of the black cowboy because there's a lot of people that don't realize that there were so many black cowboys in, in the country. The city's youth aren't usually exposed to the sport of rodeo, but when 39-year-old Clarence Gibson saw his first rodeo as a teenager, it was love at first sight. I grew up uh, in the inner city in San Antonio, and uh, in high school, I uh, moved out of the city into a rural community and rodeoed, uh, started rodeoing at that time. Uh, Mo Bandy's father, the country singer, got me started rodeoing, uh, Mr. M.F. Bandy. And through, through his inspiration and uh, use of his arena and his bulls, I started riding bulls when I was about 15 years old. And here I am turning 40 in the senior pros and still rodeoing. Another inner city youngster was the first African American to win a world championship in the sport of rodeo. He's Charles Sampson, champion bull rider from Casa Grande, Arizona, and promoter of the Bull Riders International Tour. You know, you ride the bulls, unfortunately for me, I've had my chest broke 
punctured my lung, you know, broke some ribs, broke my wrist, broke my leg four times, you know, just on and on, broke my face. You know, I broke, I was telling somebody today, I uh, broke everything on my body except my nose. <laughs> Samson escaped the gangs of South Central L.A. to become a world champion cowboy. Unfortunately for me, uh, you know, to, the way that I escaped the gangs is that I was uh, young enough to, to be surrounded with positive role models. I was young enough to have an activity to not distract me from wanting to, to pursue any other you know, things around L.A. to get into. So the stables uh, kept me out of trouble. You know, I had things to do there. I had stalls to clean out, I had horses to, to ride, you know, horses to feed. So during that time, uh, uh, when school was over with, I had to rush to the stables. I didn't have time to, to hang around the school and do the after school activities and surely didn't have time to be hanging around the guys that, you know, that hung around and got into trouble. There you go. Sit down Brian Riley. That boat came left out of gate. He's got to work that right side with that spur as he is. Who got thrown up back on the back side. Get out of there, Brian. Brian Riley of Dunham, California, has transferred his rodeo competitiveness to business success. He's now a Northern California rancher who believes blacks have made tremendous inroads in the sport but are still virtually ignored. There's more and more um, black cowboys coming out. You know, like I say, you know, the, the sky's the limit. And, you know, more or less, um, you know, there's there's been black cowboys just as long as there's been any other cowboys, you know, and it's just not shown. And, we're out there. These cowboys can all thank this man, Leon Coffey, for not only a few laughs, but for a little life-saving along the way. A bull rider for 14 years, Leon decided it was easier to fight those 2,000-pound monsters than ride them. Not everybody can look death in the eye. Because them bulls can kill you. They fight with each other every day. They can administer 2,000 pounds of pressure. That's enough pressure to take a man's head completely off, when it only takes seven pounds of pressure to break a human rib. So if they hit you or kick you just right, you're gone. Uh, when them cowboys are down, they got 1,800 pounds of massive beasts looking at them, and they're about to eat them alive. They don't really care what color you are as long as you're there to get the job done. And uh, I enjoy it. It's something not everybody can do. Uh, it's been elite of the elite because we live on the edge and uh, we live way out on the edge. You know? Charles, Clarence, and Leon are all candidates for the Black Cowboy Hall of Fame in Denver, Colorado. Leon is hardly clowning when he talks about his possible enshrinement in the hall. I cherish the idea of even entertaining the thought of being there. Of course, I don't know who's elected or anything else. It's kind of like the Pro Football Hall of Fame, you know? And uh, you don't know who's going to get there. I hope one day I will. You know, when I'm dead and gone, all I want somebody to say is that he's a pretty good old boy. And if I'm in that hall, somebody might say that. When somebody's having a bad day, I said, switch places with Gail. Now, I'm not talking about the medalist. I'm talking about the one who was infected with the grave disease. Just switch places with her. All right? Let me see if you can come up. If not, then keep quiet and keep going because you're lucky. It takes courage to succeed in any sport. But in 120 seconds, you'll see the story of courage personified. Gail Devers overcoming grave disease to win Olympic gold. Devers is poetry in motion when she glides over the hurdles. But the biggest hurdles of her life have been off the track. After going through my Graves' disease, I'm very appreciative because it's changed me as a person. It's made me more determined where I don't feel like there's anything that will ever come up in my life that I can't get over now. Good. Good. <laughs> no. 
Yeah. <laughs> Gail's coach, Bob Kersey, believes athletics saved her life and that her fiery, competitive spirit kept her going. I felt in my heart that uh, things was going to work itself out, that, you know, in time, that they were going to be able to give her the medication that was going to get the Graves' disease under control, uh, control, get the thyroid problem under control, that if I can just keep her positive, keep her healthy enough to, uh, you know, at least walk or jog or ride a bicycle or, you know, do what she could just to keep the motivation up that uh, not only could I get her on the world championship team at the time, uh, but that she could also medal and come back and then uh, uh, make the Olympic team and, and, and win an Olympic medal. Bobby is, he's like everything balled up into one. He's a disciplinarian, he's a coach, he's a teacher, counselor, a friend, a mother, and a father. <laughs> he's, um, I mean, really, he, he and Jackie and Greg Foster were the biggest support for me coming through my Graves' disease and my family. You know, if it weren't for them, I don't know what I would have done. You know, they were there as moral support for me you know, during those times when I'd get down on myself or something like that, they wouldn't let me. And I remember Bobby telling me that, you know, I'm not going to let you quit on yourself and I'm not going to let you quit on me. And that was the biggest turning point for me. To watch a person like Gail go through what she's gone, you know, what she went through for no, for, as far as we're concerned, no apparent reason, her being as nice as she is, you know, you feel sorry for her. You know, it comes at a time when she's on the verge of becoming one of the best in the world. Um, not, not knowing exactly what it was for a long time and to see her, you know, try to struggle through that day in and day out was very hard, you know, it was heartbreaking. There were times when Gail was so weak from the disease that her father and mother had to care for her all day. I wasn't supposed to touch parts of my body because I had psoriasis and the, the scaliness throughout my hands and my feet and everything. And they actually washed me, <laughs> bathed me, you know, and for me, that was the worst for me because I'm very independent and I was raised to be that way. And that was, you know, like going back to your infant stage where you have to be carried around. You have to have someone take you to the restroom and bathe you and dress you. And, you know, for me, that was the most I guess frustrating time that I went through, you know, in addition to being very close to having my feet amputated. But I'm very thankful that they were there and that the love and the support that they gave me, they did it without, you know, any question. Deaver's dazzling comeback has been chronicled as a medical miracle. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just been informed that Gail Deavers has just established a new American record, 6-10. I always say that it seems like it, it, it takes us to come to the time where those little things are almost taken away from us before we can really appreciate it. You know, now, you know, I think we take for granted that we can get up and we can walk across the room or something like that until it comes to a point where you're almost close to losing your feet. And now every day that I wake up and I'm able to put my feet on the ground, I give thanks to God that I still have them. Do you know the name Marion Jones? Well, if you don't, you certainly will in 1996. Marion made history last year, becoming the first unanimous pick as Prep Athlete of the Year. I'm a normal teenager. My mom gives me the, the openness to just do whatever what I put my mind to. what I enjoy doing, playing basketball and running track. Marion Jones can't help but daydream a bit since she has completely rewritten California prep sprinting records. I try to be open-minded about a lot of things and, and don't try to limit myself on my goals or my aspirations. Her coach, Art Green, says Marion has a knack of setting her mind on a goal. When she does, look out. She usually attains it. She's very demanding on herself and in turn will have that same type of attitude towards the teammates if they're not working out hard. I think she's always looking forward. She's never looking back. And uh, that's another great thing about her. Once something's over, then it's towards the next goal. The overall goal is, you know, to make the 96 Olympic team in Georgia. And um, my immediate goals are to be successful in, at my university, which is North Carolina, um, help my team basketball and track to win a national championship. And I chose the University of North Carolina because um, they have my major, which is journalism. 
and the most important thing is that they graduate their minorities, and that was an important part of my decision. I've seen so many athletes just concentrate on, on just their athletics that uh, it's a shame. So, you know, I've been raised that education is a priority, and you're going to take care of that before you take care of anything else. If you start something, make sure you finish it. That's the most important thing. The sport of hockey is as predominantly white as the ice itself, but a few blacks have managed to break the color barrier in the sport. The other side of victory had a chance to visit with the first black in the NHL, hockey legend Willie O'Ree. Commander Yellow 7, Brian, do you copy? Uh, how are things going down on the field, Brian? It's ironic Willie O'Ree would be handling security for NFL games in San Diego. It was O'Ree who brought screaming crowds to their feet for years in the Western Hockey League and NHL. I've always been called, uh, you know, the Jackie Robinson of hockey, uh, being the first black to, you know, break the color line and play. But I, uh, I guess, uh, you know, in the eyes of, you know, a lot of, a lot of my fans that, uh, that I am a hero. But I, you know, I played hockey for a number of years, enjoyed it. And uh, I, guess I, uh, I guess I am in a way, but I don't look at myself as, you know, as a hero. Willie became the first black to play in the NHL when the Boston Bruins called him up in 1961. Though he never experienced racism growing up, O'Ree sure felt it on the ice. I encountered problems. Uh, I knew, uh, you know, um, a, a lot of a lot of people uh, were you know, they were kind of amazed to see you know a black hockey player on the ice back then. But uh, I uh, I was determined that I had the ability. And um, I, had, I had enough uh, inside of me to say, hey, uh, you're good enough to play here. I just go out and, uh, and play hockey. I did a uh, tremendous amount of fighting at first. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't the fact that, uh, you know, I looked for trouble. It just seemed that uh, everybody wanted to, uh, you know, to try and uh, intimidate me, try and get a piece of me to just see how much I could take. So the first, um, I did quite a bit of fighting until they, they realized that, hey, this, this guy is, uh, looks like he's, uh, you know, he's, he's of some meaning and he wants to, he wants to play. Um, but uh, at first, I did, I did quite a bit of fighting. I'm going to go inside. i got to go inside. Willie oversees security at major events in San Diego. Some 400 guards work for him. He believes he learned his management skills in hockey and is convinced you can do anything, even if barriers are thrown in your way. I'm a living um, um, proof of that because I, you know, I, I, was, a, I was a black man that, uh, that played hockey, uh, broke the color barrier, and uh, played for 21 years pro. And uh, I think if you're, if you're determined, um, any, any kid today can do anything that they want to do if they, if they set their mind to do it. They can do, they can play in any any sport or they can achieve any goal that they want to achieve if they if they just keep an open mind and say hey and there's there's so many there's so many role models now that these kids can look up to in, in, in all sports I mean you know you're just not limited to football or baseball but any type of sport you want you know there's there's all minorities playing in every type of sport today and all you have to say is hey I can be I can be that type of individual all I have to do is go and just uh, and do it and become it I'm living in Laguna Hills, California. Uh, right now I'm a full-time student working on my MBA at Pepperdine University. I'm about uh, two terms away from finishing, 
So I'll, I plan on graduating in August, actually April of 94. Edwin Moses will go down in history as the king of the 400 meter hurdles. Logic and order have been the cornerstones of Edwin's life dating back to his days at Morehouse College. At Morehouse College, academics was the main thing. Um, athletics was something you did after you got your books. And you didn't think about doing it unless you were uh, a pretty dis decent student because of the um, high quality of learning at the institution. So track and field was something I did after, after physics. My training has been very scientific and very calculated. My background in physics and engineering has a lot to do with that. Um, I've done papers and written, written analyses on motion and what has to happen and how you can, how you can speed things up. Um, most people think that track people are, are, are like gods that we just come out and we have this gene that makes us run fast, but so much of it is training. Edwin Moses graduated from Atlanta's Morehouse with a physics degree. The son of two educators in Dayton, Ohio, his analytical approach to the sport of track and field made him an instant Olympic success in 1976. Well, that was a, a day that uh, I was waiting to come. Um, I was completely ready to, to, to run the Olympic final. I knew that I was in the type of shape that it would take to break a world record. And uh, that, was, that was, in my mind, my day in history to do it. And uh, fortunately, I was able to to stick with it and hang in there in training, I was able to do it. After that, every other Olympics I went to, there was all types of pressure of being a, an Olympic champion already, having a win streak, uh, being a veteran, uh, and there was a lot of other pressure involved. So the 76 Olympics was, was probably the purest um, from athletic competition for me. The accolades rolled in during the ensuing decade. And if you're talking track with someone, 400 intermediates and Moses are synonymous. The biggest race in my life was definitely the Los Angeles Olympics, um, where I went in with 104 victories and everyone had basically given me the gold medal before the race had even started, which is not what you want to have in your mind when you've got to go out there and do it. Uh, that race was, was definitely the biggest and that was um, everything that I'd ever done in my career on the line for one race. And so, depending on how big the race was, whether it was a world championship or an Olympic, uh, Olympic championship that was, that was sought after or a, a regular uh, international meet, which in someone else's mind was their Olympics because they're running against Edwin Moses, I had to be ready. So I kept myself ready to run Olympic class, world class, and or world record times for all those years. It's definitely a, an endeavor in which a person is driven to do it, otherwise you, there's no way you can do it because it's, in my opinion, it's not painless, neither the training uh, nor the competition. When you have 30, 40,000 miles on your body, you know, things begin to hurt. <laughs> I think that people have made up in their minds um, how it is that they remember me. And from what I gather, it's that I was a great athlete, um, an athlete who, uh, if I can say so myself, was considered very academic, very smart, uh, very intellectual. A lot of people are impressed with the degree in physics. Um, aside from that, people are, are impressed that I cared enough about uh, subjects like drug testing and felt so strongly about having a clean sport and doing away with it that I uh, took the challenge to direct some of those programs for the Olympic Committee and TAC and uh, the winning streak. And I think those are the things that people who don't know me are most apt to, to catch on to first, one of those four topics. And then for people who have an opportunity to meet me, they find out I'm a nice guy too. Coming up next time on The Other Side of Victory, the football edition. We'll have a story of the recruiting wars, 
And are those wars taking a heavy toll on black colleges like Grambling and Southern University in Louisiana? We are killing the small colleges, particularly our minority institutions, because we continue to usurp every avenue for success that they have. But then again, isn't that kind of like the way society works? The big get bigger, the strong get stronger, the rich get richer. It's capitalism. It's what this country is about. We'll also show you the grueling sights and sounds of an NFL training camp. What's it really like to be a rookie entering the National Football League? You come down here, you put in these five weeks of getting yourself banged up, getting up at 7 o'clock. You know, most people put on a suit and tie and go to work. You know, I'd love to do that and get paid the same amount of money I'm getting paid here, but, you know, I'm not. This right here is it, no joke. Here we go. We'll also spend time with one of the most inspirational players in any league. He's Kenny Walker of the Denver Broncos. He's currently the NFL's only deaf player. We'll also visit the winningest coach of them all, the living legend, Eddie Robinson, the head coach at Grambling University in Louisiana. All this and much more on the football edition of The Other Side of Victory. I'm James Brown. And I'm Robin Roberts. We'll look for you next time on The Other Side of Victory.